if we're happy to keep on doing what we've been doing for the last 150 years, then this whole energy security thing is quite a compelling argument. I wish that I had have been at Long Beach, California and been able to ask T. Boone Pickens, tell us, is the world going to get fried before the gas runs out or will the gas run out first? Because his whole argument about energy security seems to be founded on the basis that we have got so much fossil fuel, there's just no problem. We can just keep on burning it. We can just go into the future. So what I'd like to achieve with you today <clears throat> is to arrive at an understanding with you as an audience and as fellow South Africans. I want to appeal to the innate sense of right and wrong in this room. I want to appeal to your sense of judgment. I want to pick out that thing inside you that knows the difference between right and wrong, that knows the difference between clever in terms of technical drilling thousands of meters down and kilometers across, which is very clever technologically, and wise, which is wise for the planet. I'd like to infuse you with a passion to go out here and talk about this and think about it as South Africans. I haven't been an environmentalist for a long time. In fact, at the beginning of last year, my life was really waxed. Everything was running nicely. Everything was predictable. And then I got into this issue of shale gas mining and fracking. And that turned life upside down for me in every respect. I wouldn't change a single minute or single moment of it, of the experience. And so what I've got to share with you today, although I quote a few scientists, is not as a scientist or somebody that has got high training in this, but simply as an ordinary South African with instinct and passion. And I'd like to believe that I'm standing here and using this forum and the opportunity of being here to speak for South Africans that don't have the opportunity to come to a forum like this, whose voices are not heard in the national debate on issues like this. So we're going to talk about three numbers <clears throat> and some simple math that is going to upend the conventional political thinking on climate change and global warming and energy. The first one you're all familiar with, 2 degrees Celsius. 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It is our self-imposed limit, and we all know that we can't afford to warm the Earth more than that if we would like to remain living on it in more or less the same conditions that we have now. The bad news is we are already 0.8 of a degree towards that 2 degrees. And even tomorrow, notwithstanding all the fancy stuff that you hear about how much cleaner burning shale gas is and how it will fix our greenhouse gas emission problems. Notwithstanding that, if we kept the global warming tomorrow at today's levels, the inertia will still push us another 0.8 degrees centigrade towards that 2 degree mark. So it has become the bottomest of all bottom lines. 565 gigatons. <clears throat> Sounds like an impressive number. And a, a gigaton is a billion tons, and it relates to the amount of CO2 that we as a global community can pump out into the Earth's biosphere in the next 38 years, between now and 2050. Sounds like a long time and a lot of, a lot of gas, and what's the problem? The problem is that global emissions last year were 31.6 gigatons, and the clever people have calculated that at today's growth rates, it will take not 38 years, but 16 years to eat up that 565 gigaton budget that we have. So when we have people talking about we're overwhelmed with natural gas, I can't see the point because we can't burn it. The next number 2,795 gigatons. That relates to the carbon emission value of the fossil fuels that are locked underneath the ground at the moment. 
under the control of countries that own it, countries like Venezuela, and the big oil and fuel majors, the BPs, Chevron, Shells, Exxons, whoever it is. The frightening thing about that is that it is exactly five times what we can afford to burn between now and 2050. And the second frightening thing is that those countries and those companies, and indeed the people here today, are expecting that fossil fuel to come out from under the ground so that we can keep on living as we have always done. Another interesting issue is that although all of those fuels are still locked under the ground and unextracted, economically speaking, they are already above the ground. The companies that own them have based their share prices on them. They're paying dividends and they're borrowing money and they're making plans based on the extraction of that fuel. The countries to whom they pay tax are already counting their tax dollars and making their energy plans based on that figure. So we've got five times more than we need already to fry the planet. If we take out more than 20% of that, by the way, that reserve is estimated, estimated at $27 trillion, so essentially we would be asking the fossil fuel industry to do a $20 trillion asset write-off and leave 80% of it under the ground. Now, however that pans out is something that some of us will live to see. But one thing is for certain, we can have a fossil fuel industry with a healthy balance sheet, or we can have a living planet with a chance of survival. We can't have both. So there are four things that we need to do if we would like to disembark from this fossil fuel train. The first one is to immediately and urgently start reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. Secondly, with respect to the economists, we need to adapt to the end of economic growth as we have known it. It cannot continue. Number three, we need to design a sustainable plan to look after seven plus billion people on this planet. And number four, we need to start dealing with 100 plus years of environmental damage that has taken place during the burning of fossil fuels on Earth. Sustainability is a theme that runs through this talk. And there are two definitions that I, that I like. The one is very simple. <clears throat> Sustainable development means that the present generation can meet its needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. The one that I prefer is from the Iroquois Indians of North America, who have something called the Great Law of Peace, maybe the equivalent of a guidebook for their chiefs. And it has a requirement that the Indian chiefs will consider the results of their actions and their decisions on seven generations hence. They were wise enough to tell their leaders, you will look 560 years into the future when you're making decisions about this community. So on sustainability, we have this policy choice that many governments around the world are grappling with. And I was shocked to read of Minister Trevor Manuel's presentation at the University of Pretoria last week, when he said, in connection with looking at gas in our energy mix, our approach to gas in this country is replete with experimentation. He also said that shale gas would make a meaning, meaningful contribution to dealing with our greenhouse gas emission problems. Contemporary scientific thinking makes mockery of that. Shale gas will not change our greenhouse gas emission problem. It will reduce a little bit, but it's too little and it's too late. And our government is not about to mothball Kusile power station and send all the coal industry employees home. So it will be added on top of coal. Lastly, he said that the costing and the sequencing in the mix of shale gas in the energy are the critical issues. Well, I disagree. I think that the critical issues here are clarity, coordination, collaboration, and leadership. That's what this country needs, and I think it's about survival of this planet, not about how we are going to mix 
the fossil fuels. T. Boone Pickens also says, he starts off his speech by saying, or his presentation, I'm a believer. I'm a believer in climate change. And that's the last time we hear from him about climate change in this argument for shale gas. And I don't think it's been properly dealt with. We have Minister Shubangu, sorry, Minister Dupua Peters on her knees in South Africa begging for fracking to start. And this is not the type of leadership that we need. We need to start thinking out of the box. And if our leaders are not going to provide that clarity and leadership, we should start thinking about it. So the news is that in a showdown between the global economy and unchecked growth, climate change is going to win. There's just no doubt about it. I've got five axioms for you about sustainability, and the news is that we're on the wrong side of all of them. The first one is that any community that uses its resources unsustainably will eventually collapse. Number two, we cannot sustain global population growth rates. In terms of our use of renewable resources, I'm talking about things like fish, water, and wood. We must proceed at a rate that is not greater than the rate of natural replenishment. We cannot eat fish faster than they can breed or use our water on Earth faster than the planet can regenerate it. In connection with non-renewable uh, non resources like fossil fuels, the use of those must proceed at a rate that is declining faster than the rate of depletion. And that's the way to keep that base load going. And lastly, we have to get into dealing with what's happening with global carbon emissions. And they've got to be rendered harmless to the atmosphere by concentrated action. So climate change and the fossil fuel industry, as far as I'm concerned, need a determined industry, a determined enemy. And I believe that we can be that enemy. I think that it's in the people in this room, and I think it's inside the people that you know and the people that they know. We need to be able to deal with statements like, there will never come a day when you won't have enough natural gas. Those fly in the face of logic. <clears throat> we have a very limited window of opportunity to do something. And this chase after gas across the world is delaying the onset of alternatives that will help this planet survive. So a month stolen here and a year there in another month is taking years and years off the back end of the problem. Paul Gilding, the author of The Great Disruption, said simply, we have been borrowing from the future and the debt is now due and payable. Rachel Carson says, man is but a part of nature and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. And one of my favorite ones, Kenneth Boulding, any man, any person who believes that exponential growth is, pos is possible in a finite environment is either a madman or an economist. So we've got that limited window to do something about it, and it's not changing. I hope that some of these aspects that I've raised this afternoon, many of which you've heard, have convinced you to at least think more about this and think about your role in it. And so, to get to a what if for Africa, and I had this, this presentation really nicely waxed and everything worked out point by point, but I've heard such brilliant stuff today. And I'm going to unashamedly draw from one of the earlier speakers. Because my idea was, what if we can start this real green energy revolution in South Africa? Do we have to wait for the Americas and Europe's and the rest of the world to show us what to do? Do we have to dance to their tune? Are we forever doomed to react to what they decide is good for us? And can we not see this inevitable change that is coming? The fact that we're all headed for the edge of an environmental cliff. 
And why can't we start making those changes now in this special Africa, this fastest growing continent, economically speaking, of all the continents? Why do we need to give up that competitive advantage and wait for the so-called first world to steal the march on us? That so-called first world that nearly brought the global economy to its knees, or almost it did effectively in 2008. And even then, South Africa was already able to show the difference between our economic disciplines and theirs in America. We don't need to follow their lead. So, drawing on my earlier speakers, what if Africa colonized the world? It was also said that we consider consequences, as we've discussed this afternoon, but we fail to counter the tragedy. And it will be a tragedy if we're aware of these consequences and we do nothing to counter them. And the other thing that I liked that I heard was that painful history can be transformed through learning and wisdom. So I believe that in this room is the clarity, the leadership, the coordination, the collaboration that we need. But it is going to take a sacrifice in the way that we live and the way that we run our lives and our social investment into other people on this planet. I very nearly started off my presentation by saying, hi, I'm Jonathan, and I'm a fossil fuel addict. Because, let's face it, all of us arrived here on the, base, on the back of fossil fuels today. And we need to start thinking about ways to change that. So I stand in front of you with as much passion and instinct and promise as any 53-year-old can muster. And I'm up for the fight. But we need everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you.